Right, so I'm now going to skip section 0 0.5, which is the relationship to difference methods, because um, I'm not really entirely sure that everyone here is familiar with the finite difference method. So it's very useful <coughs> if you are a finite difference person, and you can go back and understand how that works. But um, also, most of you saw exactly that argument from James in the fluidity training. So um, that we, we will leave that alone for the moment. And what we're going to step on to is how we actually produce then these matrix systems that we have to solve in order to solve the finite element method. And one of the uh, <coughs> things that makes the finite element method work, and for the benefit of people here who work on uh, FireDrake, one of the things that makes all of the parallelization magically available is the fact that we can carve up the problem into do the integral on one element and then somehow assemble that, splat that result out into a global vector or a global matrix. And the way we do that is um, with what in this book is called the global to local index in um, for fluidity people, is called the um, node global number, NDGLNO. Um, and for PyOP2 slash FireDrake people, is called the uh, cell node map, or respectively facet node map, or however that runs out. And for Phoenix people, it's called the DOF map. So I think that covers all of the terminology that anyone around here might use for this. And so what that is saying is if I've got my space out there and I know that I'm on element E, then I can write a function I of E and J. And what this is, is given that I know I'm on this element, and I've got a local node number, and so my local node numbers will, for the piecewise linear case, vary in the range 0 and 1. So there are two um, uh, basis functions which are non-zero on each element, so there are two possible values that can take. I can work out a function, and by a function we basically mean a lookup table, which gives me the global numbers. So in this case, so if these are nodes 0, 1, 2, 3, four, five, and if I'm in this element, then this is saying that I E zero equals one and I E one equals two, for example, because those are the global numbers which correspond to the local numbers where I am. And that simple trick is how um, essentially, everybody implements finite element on unstructured meshes. So, um, and we will, for all purposes, assume that our meshes are unstructured. I realize that that's a particularly structured mesh. It's kind of hard to do unstructured meshes in purely 1D. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so I think that's all that we need to do there. And so, what that means uh, is that, um, yeah, so they've actually given the formula for what I could be on the one dimensional mesh, which is a form of direct addressing. But we're going to ignore that. And so now what we can do is for functions which are in our space, so we can write interpolant functions, which are the ones in our space, and this is equal to the sum over all elements of the sum from j equals 0 to 1. So remember earlier, we wrote the interpolant as the sum over all i, so all global uh, indices, of a function evaluated at a particular 
um, point times a basis function. And we're still going to do that, but now, instead of summing over all i's, I'm just going to sum over the two available j's, and I'm going to look up what the relevant i is. And so this is another wonderful opportunity for horribly confusing notation. So here, this is what they're writing for a local basis function. So the local basis functions on the unit interval, um, so here's the interval 0, 1, they look like this. There's one that goes like that, and there's one that looks like this. That's what we can see locally. And in order to make this expression make sense, what we actually do is we define that the local basis functions not on this interval are zero everywhere. That makes this expression make sense, but actually you, uh, the, you, you never actually care because the point of this exercise is you only ever look at two of them. You only ever look at the ones that are non-zero where you are. And so the notational confusion turns up because people have different notations. So this book um, says this is phi local to this element, so they call it phi superscript e. In um, Phoenix land, they tend to uh, go to uppercase. So if they were writing lowercase phi for the global basis function, they would write uppercase phi for the local basis function. And I can't even remember what notation is used in the Fluidity documentation for this. Um, which is embarrassing because I wrote quite a lot of the relevant documentation, but it's been a while. So, what does this do? Well, if we want to be computer scientists for a couple of seconds, what it means is that evaluating the interpolant at a given point now turns into an order one operation. Because we, we always look at exactly two basis functions in order to interpolate. Whereas mathematically, it was an order n operation, right? It was a sum over all available basis functions. And this works because we know that the basis functions are zero uh, almost everywhere. So the basis functions have compact support, which is um, a concept that we will meet next week when we try to do a more formal definition of taking derivatives. And what that then means is that we can use the linearity of that sum and the linearity of integration in order to integrate anything we like. So um, if I wished to integrate fi over the entire domain, uh, what I would do is I would sum over all the elements and I would take the integral over an individual element of <coughs> um, the uh, sum j equals 0 to 1. Oh, look, linear sum. Set that outside as well. Of F evaluated at x i of e j times um, the um, phi j e the now I have to be a little bit careful here. This is now needs to be so this needs to be an integral dx over the local element. So I'm going to have to change coordinates on that integral uh, interval in just a second. Right. So, so I've just dy, or dj, sorry, dj. No, j is an integer. Can't right. possibly be an integral on that. So, no, what's going on is I have, um, this is a global integral. I've cut the global integral up into little bits, but I haven't yet so these things are expressed in local coordinates that go from 0 to 1. Um, and this thing is still a global coordinate, which is going from xi to xi plus 1 at this particular point. So um, that, that we don't know how to do yet. Uh, but the other thing I can do at this point is I can notice that that thing is a number. It's a number evaluated at a particular point, and that particular point doesn't 
very unusual. So actually, so what we can uh, essentially always do for linear problems at least, we'll worry a bit later about ones when we have other coefficients in there, is we can reduce um, integrals to integrals of basis functions scaled by numbers that we either know or don't know, right? If we know them, then we substitute the number in and we do a sum. And if we don't know them, then what we have is an unresolved sum over numbers, over all the i's. And an unresolved sum over all the i's is called a vector, right? It's a series of numbers which we could sum together with known numbers if we had them. And similarly, if we've got two of those, we get a matrix. We have two vectors we could hit it with. And if we knew what those two vectors were, and we sum them all out, we get a number. And so that stump there is basically all you need in order to get out all of the matrices and vectors that you're then going to feed to your linear solver and get a solution to your system. That's uh, what's going on under the hood in uh, essentially all finite element systems. So let's deal with this little problem over here that I haven't yet done, which is uh, that the integral over my element of phi, j, e, and phi is, so here's my problem. Phi is a function of what they call x. Let's be very careful here. They haven't given us a name for the local variables. That was nice of them. OK, so I'm going to use Phoenix notation and say that the local variable would be big X when the global variable was little x. Right, so there's my problem. I've got an integral in two different variables. Fortunately, we're in one dimension here, and I was paying attention in high school, so I know how to change um, variables on an integral. So this is dx 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 and um, so what's this thing? So that thing is, well we have to go back to our original change of coordinates formula and our original change of coordinates formula said um, x equals x i minus 1 plus x, oh, they used x to the, well, we use big X, big X times x i minus x i minus 1. And so what I want to do is I want to compute the derivative of that with respect to big X. So the x t big x is equal to, so there's no big X's in there, so the derivative of that term is 0. That's a big X times something which has no big X's in it. So the derivative of that is X I minus X I minus 1. So all that's done, all, all, of that, all of that jumping around did was to say that um, if I wanted to take the derivative of this thing in local coordinates over the interval, so now this is now if I'm big to get x, this is over the reference interval. If I want to stretch out the integral over, to, to be the integral over 0, 1, I have to scale by the length of the interval. That's all that was. This is the length of the interval. So, um, so that's what I do. And um, in more dimensions, we'll come back to more dimensions uh, in a future lecture, but in more dimensions, this um, you have more components of little x, and you have more components of big X, and because um, we're going to be a bit more advanced in this course, not necessarily the same number of components of small x as big X. So if I want to solve a two-dimensional problem on the surface of a sphere in three dimensions, I've got three coordinates in my physical space, but I transform that back to a two-dimensional triangle. I don't have to be the same size. So when I get this, I have a Jacobian matrix. right? So it's dxi, dxj, 
just in this case, those are only allowed to vary over one, so it's a scalar. And then this scaling factor uh, will turn out to be the determinant of that Jacobian. So it's the amount that that Jacobian matrix would stretch something that was hit by it, the de what the determinant is. Um, but we are now still at this stage in a convenient space where that is just the length of the interval. So that's great. So what does that mean? So what that means is um, we can now, for example, assemble the right-hand side of our equation. So um, let's, let's do that. So in order to assemble the right-hand side of our equation, if we remember way back at the beginning, the right-hand side is the integral of um, v, f, dx, where we know f, and that's true for all v in, so now it's true for all v in cg1, right? So it's true for all v in cg1, well, cg1, zero, cg1, which is constrained to obey our um, boundary condition. That's the specification. And we learned last time that actually it's enough to do this for all by i. And for practical purposes, so this is not a requirement of the finite element method, and there are mechanisms for doing other things, but for practical purposes, it's often the case that we take this known function in a function space that we know how to represent in terms of uh, elements, so in a discrete function space, just for the practical matter that we needed to actually record this function in our computer using a finite number of points. So what that means is So, so that's still only a vector because there's still only one free index in there because we're summing over j. So the j's go away. So there's still a free vector i. So this is going to assemble into a vector with one entry for each possible value that phi i could take. So now we want to do this by visiting each cell, doing something locally, and then putting that back into a global vector. So what we can do is we can say, OK, so we're going to split this into a sum over all the elements of fj integral element phi i by j dx. And um, people who are paying close attention will notice that actually, um, way back at the beginning when I did the sums, doing a sum of the pointwise values doesn't actually make sense because you do something wrong at the, at the edges. But we're now summing integrals. So that's fine. We don't care about the edge points. This is the recurring theme of this lecture is the edge points really don't count. So now what do I need to do? I um, want to, and this is true for, for all i, but actually, while I'm visiting a particular element, I might as well turn this problem around. So remember that, so now let's, because I've used i here, and using i and j here is kind of conventional. Um, let's call our external function k of e j, right? So this is the thing that gives us a global index. And 
So what I want to do is when I visit one particular element, I want to do that once and do everything that occurs with that element at that point. So what that means is when I visit element E, I want to take phi uh, i for all i, so local phi i, for all i in the set 1, uh, 0, 1. So I will deal with both of the phi i's, which are non-zero on this element, in one visit to the element, because that's efficient. And I will, what I need to do with those is convolve them with all phi j's. Integrate them, sorry, not convolve them. Integrate them times all phi j's. But remember, there's only two phi j's, which occur in here as well. So this means I have phi j on this element. And that's a sum. j equals 0 to 1. And now I need to hit j with the right f's, because f's are known values, right? We need to insert the f's at this point. So j equals 0, 1. So here, what I know is the global values of j, the global vector of this. So now I need to use my lookup table function to get those back. So this is f, k, e, j. Right, so that's the, the right global value that I picked up times the integral of these local values. And I want to do the interval in local variables, so I have to work out this. Okay, and so I can do that. So what I have to pass in to the little function I'm going to write which does this is f, k, e, j for j equals 0 and 1. So that's two numbers, which are the global f values for the two ends of this interval. And I also got to work out this guy. So dx dx equals x of the right hand side. So x of the right hand side is x k e 1 minus x k e 0. So I need to pass in those two numbers as well. So I look up, so I use my lookup tables to work out um, the two values of f and the two values of x, and those are the two things I pass into a little routine. You don't have to make it a separate routine, but actually it's a separate routine in Fluidity, and it's a separate routine in FireDrake, and it's a separate routine in Phoenix, so there's a little bit of a pattern going on here. It's a sort of logical way of programming this. And now I get a number back. In fact, I get two, um, two numbers back, because I'm doing this for i in x0, 1. So I calculate this integral for the first and the second basis function. So this little routine is going to return back two numbers. So what the hell do I do with those two numbers? So those two numbers are the chunk of the contributions to two of the global phi i values that comes from this element. But they're not whole lot. Right, so this right-hand side vector is going to have this many entries, fudging ever so slightly for a second about what happens at the zeroth entry, because that's kind of a special case, right? But for all of the other ones that actually are, are real entries, 
And so each one of these is it's phi i times all the phi j. So it's this one. Right? Times <coughs> something else. So there's going to be a contribution from the integral over this element and from the integral over this element and not from any of the others. So what we've done is we've turned this round. We've visited, say, this um, entry, this uh, element here, and we've worked out what this element will contribute to the guy at this side and what this element will contribute to the guy at this side. So what we have to do is we have to use our lookup table again. So this thing is going to give us RE, say, oh, we're using superscripts on RE. So this is going to give us a local right-hand side for our um, element. And when we pass that back, we're going to plug it into the um, right-hand side by saying that the right-hand side vector at the place we now look up, so at, at the index of this element at the left-hand side, gets added to it. The first entry that we calculated, the left-hand entry from this sum. And similarly, RKE1 gets the right-hand side. So that's what we do with the two numbers we worked out down here. And so what that means is that just using this lookup function that we defined, we can turn everything into a local problem. So we first of all use the lookup function to work out which global numbers to pack down and feed into the uh, local routine. And when we get the result back from the local routine, we use the lookup function to unpack it back out into the vector values. And that's kind of all that's going on there. Um, when we get to uh, dealing with this guy here, so when we visit this element, uh, what happens is locally it looks like there are these two basis functions. And for f, there really are. Because f is not subject to the um, boundary conditions, right? You can force our system with any function you like. It's the solution that has to comply with the boundary conditions. So f will take a possibly non-zero value there, so that's fine. We look up that, we feed that in, we get this. Um, x takes an actually zero value there, but it need not because we might have our interval somewhere else. So x also has a sensible value here, so we can look that up down here. What then happens is we get out this two vector, and that includes the contribution for this basis function that we know doesn't exist. And so the way you deal with this is at that point when you've got out, you just chuck out that way. Um, if you want to really technically know what goes on, in Fire Drake when we're assembling a vector, we actually put that value into the vector because it's a convenient thing to do. And what happens is after we've um, done the assembly, we go back and we reset all the boundary values in the vector. That's just an implementation detail. Um, the, uh, you don't have to do it that way. You can check it out to start with. In FireDrake, when we use, uh, when we assemble a matrix, we actually chuck it out at that point. In fact, we do something even more sneaky. What we do is we fiddle with this function and we cause this function to return a negative number every time we hit a boundary um, node. And we use Petsy to assemble our matrices. And Petsy has a really convenient behavior, which is if you feed Petsy a negative row or column number, it just throws out the value you gave it. So we let Petsy deal with that boundary condition for us. Which is kind of um, convenient. OK, so that was the left-hand side. Now we've got to do the right-hand side. Sorry, that was the right-hand side. Now we do the left-hand side. Yeah. How did you get the right-hand side formula up there? I didn't quite understand this the one. link between the equation we're so solving. We just, and that was on the previous board, right? So with the right -hand side. We, we just went through that. So we have the right-hand side is the integral of f v dx. We know that it's sufficient 
to do this for all basis functions. We, um, we made an assumption that we could write our function f in our function space. Done. Okay. So there's no, it's not necessary for this to be the same function space. So nothing very much would have changed if this was a different space. It's just I need now have to have two lookup functions instead of one lookup function. And there are other options. But this is by far the most common way of doing it. Okay, so let's do the right hand side, uh, the left hand side. Let's do the matrix assembly. So, in order to do matrix assembly, so remember what the other side of our equation looks like. It looks like the integral of u prime v prime <coughs> dx, and um, that's for all the in CG1 side of finding our boundary conditions. Uh, so once again, we know that we can replace that with, uh, now I have to remember which way around we want to do this. We want to have i as the uh, rows, so that's i. So the rows, you have one, one equation per boundary condition, uh, per test function. So if I want to be conventional and number the rows of my matrix i and the columns of my matrix j, the test function one is the i one. And so then, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to write u as u i phi i, and I don't know what the ui's are yet, right? This is the whole point of this exercise is to produce a matrix equation which I can solve in order to get the ui's. So that means that this becomes in here phi prime j, and that's notionally going to be contracted with a, a vector out there, uj, but we don't know what that is. And so this is what I said earlier. If we don't know what those are, we just separately store the values for each of these. So globally, this defines our matrix, right? So we've got a, a big matrix here, and at the, say that's the, two, three position in there, that will be the second test function, second test basis function, hitting the third trial function. That's a sum, right? Over J. If, if we put, if we know uj, it becomes a sum. Okay. Right? So when we don't know uj, it's not a sum. Oh, but and it's, not, a, it's the it's term. It, you, okay. it's, yeah. it's individual term of the matrix. That's right. Okay, okay. Yeah. So a matrix is a bilinear operator. Right? A matrix is something where if you gave me two vectors, we'd get a number back. So when we have the two known vectors, one on the left side, one on the right hand side, then everything turns into sums, both i and j. But because they're unknown, these are free indices, and we end up with a two-dimensional array of values to get out. It's the so, um, same trick as before. Sum over all the elements of phi, uh, the integral from 0 to 1. So this was the integral over the whole domain of, OK, so this, is, this gets fun again. So I'm going to stop using the uh, uh, the um, uh, dash notation for the derivatives because it suddenly matters. So this is what we did before. Um, the only so the difference is now are um, so these things are local, and so this is now because these are unknown. There are no sums in here. This is for all i in zero one, for all j in zero one. So this is now not the sum, but it's the local tensor assembly. So this is k e is equal to this guy. 
So that means because this is zero one, this isn't zero one, this is a little two by two, right? Because I've got two test functions which are non-zero on this element and two trial functions. So the two test functions give me two rows, the two trial functions give me two columns. That's the, the little matrix that I get here. And so that's exactly the same change of variables I did earlier. And now I'm going to have to do something like that again because these were global gradients. So they are gradients with respect to the global vector. And these things are local basis functions, which I know with respect to this thing, which goes from 0 to 1. So I once again think back to the dim and dark days of high school calculus, and I say that this is equal to um, dx, d big x, d little x, d So that's fine. So we know that because this thing is the length of the current interval. So this thing is 1 over the length of the current interval. So that's fine. Um, and if you're being really perceptive, you'll notice that some of these appear to cancel. Uh, I'm not going to make them cancel because actually, if we were, the, the, the fact that they cancel immediately is a consequence of us being in one dimension. If we're in more dimensions, then this thing is still a number the determinant, but now these would no longer be derivatives, they gradients, right? So this would be, uh, so this thing would have multiple components, and so this thing isn't the determinant of the Jacobian, it's the Jacobian, and that's the little matrix multiply that occurs in there. So in more dimensions, those aren't actually the same thing, they don't cancel, it's only because in uh, one dimension, a one by one matrix, which is what that really is, looks the same thing as a scalar. Really, they're not. So, okay, so that we know how to do. Right? I can write down that that's a completely local operation. That's a completely local operation. And in order to compute these things, what I need to do is I need to get x, k, um, e, 0, uh, 1 minus x, k, e, 0. So I have to use my lookup table to pass those in. So my little function for doing this integral is going to take only two numbers in, those two numbers, and it's going to give me these four numbers back. It's going to give me this um, little two by two. And the same sort of trick applies to what we do with these numbers when we come out again. So when I have... Now my matrix, then um, when I visit this element, then I'm going to get back contributions to the one, two rows and one, two columns. So that's going to need to be plugged in kind of here. And when I visit this one, I'm going to get back contributions to the two, three rows and the two, three columns. So each contributions are going to overlap like that, and so on. And if you had a, if we're in more dimensions, so this was a properly unstructured mesh, then the global numbers of the um, points on each element wouldn't necessarily be adjacent to each other anymore. And so what happens is you would splat out to some sort of square structure. It's always a split square, right, because the, the row and the column indices are the same and they, they would splat out there. So what that means maths-wise is that if I have a, my global matrix K, then it's K, little k, lookup table of elements I, K, lookup table of element J, 
that gets, oh sorry, um, right, and that goes over two by two. And that is exactly what every finite element thing you deal with will do if it's assembling matrices. Um, there is another option which is called matrix free, which we might deal with on another occasion. And so that's all that's going on there, and that it brings us completely uh, to the end of this lecture. And so what we're going to do next week is uh, we're going to go into a little bit of chapter one. I'm not sure I'm going to follow this this book all the way through this course, but um, if we go into chapter one next week, we're going to look at weak derivatives and understand a little bit, a little bit more, take out a little bit more of the hand waving that we've been doing. Uh, from a course practical perspective, um, we will have a lecture next week, assuming I can book the room on a suitable day. And then after that, I am out of the country in uh, first San Francisco and then the Great Barrier Reef and places like that. So I'm afraid to say that for that will be the last lecture for this calendar year and we'll pick up again in the new year in probably the second week of January if anyone I can organise. Is next week Thursday or Friday? Uh, I don't know because I haven't yet looked into the calendar. So this room we booked almost all the time so we're being driven by when I can book this room because obviously we can't do this anywhere else because of the recording.